So welcome to this panel uh, entitled Hating Morality. My name is Felix Heidenreich. I'm in Stuttgart in the southwest of Germany, and I'm very pleased and honored to take part in this uh, wonderful conversation. I'm very happy and I'm, yeah, I'm very proud and, and honored to see that so many people from different countries are following these, these debates. I think it's very, very important to keep the international debate going. And um, we have the very great pleasure and the extraordinary honor to talk to Omri Böhm uh, in this segment. Uh, Omri is a professor of philosophy at the New School of Social Research in, in New York City. Um, he also spends a lot of time in, in Berlin. He's joining us from Berlin at the moment. Uh, he's very well known in the public sphere uh, in Germany. He's one of the leading uh, younger public intellectuals um, in, in the German public sphere, but you will also find his publications um, in the English speaking um, uh, global public sphere. So Omri, um, thank you very much for, for doing this uh, today. We also really would like to hear from you, hear from you about your questions and maybe your points of view. So please do not hesitate to, um, to give us some input uh, that we will uh, take into account in the later part of the segment. Thanks so, and thanks for the generous introduction. <laughs> so Omri, we, decided to talk about um, hating morality. And uh, it's a very difficult topic. It's, um, it's about the relation between politics and morality. And I think a good starting point would be to try to, um, to talk about the phenomenon of hate against morality, of a certain disgust towards moral morality. Uh, that in my view, well, maybe it's not totally new, but um, it's still puzzling in my view. We had this, um, this moment when uh, we learned that apparently Donald Trump called these soldiers who sacrificed their lives uh, in order to, to liberate uh, Europe from, from Nazi rule, when he called them losers. Okay, we do not exactly know if this is the exact term he used, but he, he would call uh, John McCain a loser. And to me, this is really a, a riddling uh, phenomenon. This, um, you know, you might call it the end of hypocrisy, the open and blunt rejection of moral values. Um, please help me to sort out of this, this phenomenon. Can you explain to me what is going on there? What is your point of view here? Can I, I mean, I have some thoughts about this uh, naturally, but can I, can I actually turn uh, um, um, for starters with a question to you about this? Because um, I'm interested in the way you formulated the question. Hmm. Um, you didn't just speak about rejecting or denying yeah. morality, but you spoke about hate and disgust. Hmm. And I'm interested how you unpack that. Why is this, you know, I'm, I'm frankly, when I um, speak to not just to um, people, I know the Israeli scene relatively well, I know the American scene a little bit or more than a little bit. Um, uh, when I speak to people in those countries, I see definitely a rejection of morality um, um, on the right, but frankly, also on the left. That's something that we should also probably uh, be speaking about um, in this conversation. But I wonder about this hate and disgust. Mm -hmm. How do you, what do you mean by that? Well, maybe this is uh, a typical German phenomenon. I'm, I'm not so sure, but there's in, in German, there's a term called moralisieren, moralizing, you know, moralizing politics. And that's, it has become uh, a commonplace in political communication. We should not take into account uh, moral consideration when it comes to rejecting migrants. We should stop talking about all these ridiculous moral arguments when it comes to this or that topic. And in my view, it's, it's more than rejection. Uh, it's really the idea that, and it, this is in particular true, of course, uh, for the right-wing populists, uh, that they feel that they have to defend against a certain moral hegemony, that they have to uh, not only refuse to follow moral values, but that they really, they feel triggered in a way. They, uh, they have very high emotional energy uh, pointed against uh, those who argue with moral values in, in, in the 
political sphere. Yeah, definitely. Also, when I um, I mentioned also the phenomenon of uh, uh, finding this also on the left and not just the right. Definitely, when I'm speaking, say again to my students, and we speak about universalism. I don't know if we want to equate mor morality and universalism. That's another thing that will have to be probably brought up explicitly in a few minutes. But um, um, there is something that's um, that's deeper than just rejection, and I take it um, it has to do with the fact that. Um, morality or universalism, if the two can be equated to a certain degree, mm. um, um, they're hated, they're not just rejected, uh, they're not just denied, and they're hated because, um, maybe paradoxically, they're considered to be a source of injustice. They're sort of to be a, a source of, and you also use similar terms, of hypocrisy. And I think that brings us back to um, one thing that you mentioned, you know, you mentioned how, say, Trump, uh, spoke about um, stopping to pretend, mm -hmm. stopping to pretend, a certain nihilism that goes into this notion of stopping to pretend. But I'm again, I'm, I'm extremely interested in this notion of stopping to pretend because it would imply that nihilism runs much deeper than um, um, uh, just say the Trump phenomenon or the uh, extreme right populist, ethnic populist, ethnic nationalist, and so forth and so forth phenomenon or phenomena, um, um, but that it runs much deeper because, because the question would be, what are we pretending about? And uh, do we become nihilist when we stop pretending? And uh, we have to back paddle to what is it, a noble lie, um, in order to um, accept norms again? So when we return from someone like um, Trump to someone like Biden, are we back paddling to a certain lie and we will now gain something by pretending again? Those would be my questions, I think, um, when we touch this. Um, is Trump asserting the truth? I, I suppose that would be, uh, um, uh, stating that so um, um, straightforwardly would be obviously false, but it's an interesting question to raise, whether to a certain degree, um, um, those populists at least claim that they're saying something that's actually true, and um, whether we have an answer, whether we have an answer to that, that would be um, my question. Can we stand behind morality or um, uh, can we not? Well, I mean, you, you already, already used the term paradoxical and maybe there are, there are quite a number of different paradoxa uh, involved here. I mean, one, one paradoxon seems to be that um, populist leaders on the one hand, claim that they have the right to openly lie. I mean, this to me is still remains something rather puzzling. I mean, uh, it's, I think it's something different uh, to lie and to pretend not to lie or to, to lie openly. And in this movement of, of lying openly is a moment of covering uh, decovering uh, um, the truth of the hypocrisy of the other. So uh, there seems to be a paradoxical movement here um, to stop the hypocrisy of I'm not lying is a truth and the truth is I'm a liar just as all the others are liars. This, this seems to be the, the Trump narrative. But um, I wonder if this, and this is how I, I understood your, your remark just now, that maybe um, there is something really that is uncovered by this end of, of hypocrisy and that maybe um, we should rethink about the underlying nihilism or the underlying absence of, of moral values in, in, in society. Is that what you're trying to very much, yes, I think, I think that's right. So it's not necessarily uh, um, that he's expressing the truth, but, um, um, but when we speak about the open lying or the uh, uh, stopping to pretend, um, we need to notice that the real nihilism has to do with the question of, uh, have we been actually pretending? And if so, what about? Such that our situation is much worse. And in that sense, it's really an invitation, phenomenal, Trump, um, uh, and not just Trump, are really an invitation mm. to um, uh, consider deeper questions that in fact have been successfully buried and not raised 
mm -hmm. um, uh, instead of just back paddling to uh, uh, let's say pretending with uh, um, say um, an old school politician like Joe Biden or something like that. I'll give you an example. I like starting my uh, uh, Kant seminars and not just them uh, by just coming into class and reading a paragraph to my students. Um, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, that they're endowed by the creator with inalienable rights, that among them are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. More or less accurate quote and a familiar one. When I started um, 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 teaching philosophy 13 years ago or so, and I did that, I asked my students, so how many of you uh, believe those truths? Everybody raised their hands, everybody, automatically. The follow-up question was, okay, if you believe in it, why? What grounds your belief in those universal truths? And of course, the answer is not so, it's not so easy to give an answer to that question. Um, if you do not believe in God, or if you do not think that God is a, a basis of um, um, your morality, then you have a problem because the paragraph actually explicitly refers to God as a ground of um, those values. If nature, if you look at nature and you look at it as a Darwinist, then you also have a problem grounding those truths. So what grounds it? Is it just blind faith? Um, um, and if so, are you any better than any, um, say, um, back in the day, tea party uh, um, uh, person who has their own faith? Not so easy. When I now enter classes and I ask this question, nobody raises their hands, right? They all know that Jefferson was a slaveholder, that Enlightenment universalism is just an ideology uh, for white men. Hmm that American liberty is just a way to assassinate the emancipation of the slaves. What are we left with? Do we stand by those truths or don't we? And if we don't, what is actually the argument against Trump? What is the argument against, to uh, uh, take it outside of the comfort zone of uh, fighting against Trump, uh, look at, uh, and let's also not go to the comfort zone of uh, Bibi Netanyahu, what's the, uh, um, um, uh, in the name of what are we fighting against, say, the occupation, against the power, um, um, and so forth, and, and so forth. Um, it's not obvious, and it's not obvious that when we back paddle to the old principle, we have stamped something to stand by. I take this to be the defining question of, on the one hand, phenomena like Trump, and important to say not just Trump, and on the other hand, phenomena like so-called, and this is a complicated term, but identity liberalism, or the rejection of universalism, the hate of morality coming also from the left. I think I, I see more clearly now uh, in what way uh, maybe there's a congruence, uh, two congruent views, um, a right-wing Darwinistic, I don't know, a racist uh, critique of morality and a left, a left critique of morality or of the classic morality. Um, would, you, would you state that both versions are a critique of what we might call the classical idea of the West or of universalism. Is that is that what 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 you would see as the underlying you know problem which pops up here and there and at different places? I think that unfortunately, yes. I think it's compl I think it's complicated and dangerous, and I don't like um, uh, putting it in too simplistic terms. My you know my heart uh, beats on the left, uh, so to speak. So uh, I do not think, and I think that uh, one ought not to equate so-called identity politics or lingos of identity, which exist, and I think that should not be denied. Um, 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 on the left. One should not equate them with similar identity trends on the right. Um, broadly speaking, on the right, um, uh, identity lingo will be on the side of ethnicity and uh, the nation, nationalism, right? Mm -hmm. um, on the uh, left, that would be gender, race, class, and so forth, even though class is a slightly different category. Um, but both are stated in denial and arguably, as you also suggested, uh, with a certain disdain to the lingo of universalism, treating it as um, 
hypocritical and fake, the danger in my view seems to be, well, first that if we have given up on a universalist perspective, then uh, we're only left with a game of power, arguably. And then the question often is who shoots first? Um, often it's not the right people who shoots first, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. um, um, but even worse, it becomes difficult to distinguish between the left and the right. So I, I think that by all means, the task ought to be to develop the type of uh, thinking, the type of framework that will allow us to, um, um, to fight the fight, which is non-compromising. That's the next uh, step of the argument here. Um, in the name, indeed, of um, um, groups that are underrepresented, that are uh, persecuted, uh, uh, that do not belong to the uh, groups of all citizens, and so forth and so forth. To be sure, I also think that what, um, um, and in my knowledge at least of the uh, um, conversation in Germany, those are the people who would be using um, the moralizing or the moralizing category the most are the um, actually not on the left or the right, but the people in the alleged universalist center. They are the ones who will tell us, um, um, you're uh, skeptical, you will correct me in a moment. Those are the people that in my experience will tell us, um, we are liberal universalists. We are rational, rational exactly in the sense of seeking our interests, seeking compromise, seeking toleration. This is what it means to be rational and universalist. When you start speaking about justice in a non-compromising way, in a radical way, you're moralizing. And that's somewhere on the spectrum of childish and dangerous. Mm. Um, um, to that extent, I would agree that they're all basically identity categories. The, uh, the nationalists, the, what we have come to call, uh, for better or worse, identity politics. And uh, um, um, by all means, I think we can call them white men in the center who pretend to be universalists. But the language of real universalism, um, I think, is um, slightly missing from that. I'm not sure that we can still support it, but that's, um, that's the question. Mm -hmm. So you now painted us a, a broad panoramic picture of, of, of the philosophical debate of our time. And uh, you also posed this question not in a rhetorical uh, manner of how to defend universalism. And we now already heard that maybe there are two kinds of universalism. Maybe there is um, the universalism of white men who pretend to be real universalists, and maybe there's something more radical or more profound. And um, well, you told us you, you, you uh, teach a lot of Kant and uh, Immanuel Kant is a very important philosopher to you. Um, please tell us a bit more about how, how do you, in what way is Kant a, a very important point of reference in order to, to give an answer to this question of a different kind or a new kind of universalism? I think the most interesting uh, question for me with Kant is whether he can actually defend um, um, radical universalism. That is a certain universalism that does, is not reducible to the interest of um, the people who promote it. And he tries to do this by um, overcoming the tendency to ground universal moral claims by appealing to say God. Um, God cannot ground um, um, universalism, uh, just arguably because God doesn't exist, but that's a, um, that's a longer conversation. Maybe um, he has more important things to do. Perhaps, um, um, even though I think we're getting into trouble when we're even calling him a he, but uh, um, I'm just kidding. The, uh, um, hopefully he has better things to do. And uh, um, uh, nature, as we said, um, arguably cannot ground um, mm -hmm. um, universalism. So the question is, what can ground it? And I think Kant is really, um, to understand Kant, is to understand that this is the main question that motivates it. Can we somehow um, 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 ground universalism not in God and not in nature? And the answer is in freedom. And more specifically, and this is maybe sometimes underestimated, he wants to ground it in um, the freedom of thought, I think in the, uh, the fact that human beings can um, think freely, 
to the extent that this is true, then human beings are the type of beings um, that cannot be reduced to facts about them. They are motivated not just by causes, but by reasons, not just by uh, interests, but by justification. That's the expression of um, the claim that they are free and that they are rational in a certain way. Mm -hmm. um, that's also the main reason uh, why, um, if that's true, human beings cannot be treated as means, but always have to be treated as ends. They are the type of beings um, who are not reduced to facts about them, but are free to set their own ends. Um, Why is this so important? It's so important because once we overcome the tendency to treat human beings as reducible to facts about them, the concept of humanity is necessarily abstract. It cannot have a certain content of uh, speaking about this type of race, this type of gender, this type of nation, this type of history, this type of language, you name it. The concept of human beings cannot be scientific in the broadest sense of the term, not biological, not zoological, not historical or sociological. It can only be, and I think that's the main uh, lesson to be taken from Kant, it can only be a moral category, being human, not a biological or historical one. Mm -hmm. To say that it can only be a moral category means that it's always coming with a certain ought, with a certain... Um, task of becoming human, of um, being human, but not, you're, you're not human just in virtue of nature. This is not something that happens to you by necessity. Um, a mature bird, unless um, it's uh, sick, will learn to fly. To become a mature human being is uh, something that's much more complicated than that, something that depends on your freedom. To the extent that we can adopt this concept of humanity, it implies two things at once, I think. First, that humans cannot be treated as means, only as ends. That's already pointed to the categorical imperative, obviously. But relatedly, that we cannot discriminate between different human beings. The concept of the categorical imperative can only go hand in hand with strong universalism that does not compromise about um, your ethnicity, your religion, your gender, and so forth. Now, of course, Kant famously is also well-known debates, especially as these days, all the more so in Germany, I think less so in Israel. Um, uh, Kant, the person, of course, was um, uh, a sort of a racist himself. Uh, he definitely expressed many racist views. Um, I think that that precisely can be dissociated from the, uh, um, the doctrine because the doctrine insists that no facts about humans can motivate respect to humanity. I think that taking seriously that perspective, taking seriously that challenge is today where universalism is being rejected basically all across the political spectrum, on the right, on the center and the left. Mm -hmm. I think that trying to rehabilitate that perspective for us is a worthwhile uh, challenge. I would just like to point out, because I suppose this is of interest to, to our listeners, um, the pressure uh, that you might put on, on the concept of rationality implied here. I mean, the, the, the history of philosophy after Kant could be written as a history of uh, the critique of Kant. Uh, you know, we learned so much about um, the human being having a body, having a history, having a culture. Could you tell us more about how, how, to, how to answer all these long critiques of, you know, showing that we as human beings are made of flesh and are, you know, incarnated in our, in our world, in our bodies, and that maybe what we imagined as a transcendental reason uh, is, is, you know, has a basis in our, in our biology and in our physics and our, in our being in the world, to use a, a, a term uh, that Heidegger used uh, in, in Sein and Zeit. Not to, uh, not to um, make my job here too um, 
um, too easy almost, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and to, uh, to catch the Heideggerian illusion and attack. Um, um, but I think that's actually a good, it's actually, it's actually a good example of the way in which the right and the left are getting confused off in this space. Right? Yeah, I, I was also referring to, to Maurice Merleau-Ponty and, you know, all this tradition of, you know. Sure. Look, I mean, one way, one way to, I think, uh, uh, begin to relate to your question, um, which of course is not, we're not going to answer it in uh, 20 minutes here, um, mm -hmm. uh, to say the least, um, is to, um, to relate maybe to this notion, people sometimes like accusing Kant that he is a thinker of purity, Reinheit, mm. right? Um, and um, there is this, um, this claim that no, Kant, um, you know, he believes in purity, purity is this, purity is that, um, but um, purity is for uh, Nazis basically, we're not looking uh, for purity. I think that often when those criticisms are um, uh, being raised, they're not being raised even by people, you know, it's not that they haven't read um, the whole Kantian uh, um, uh, body of literature. They often did not even read the title of the main philosophical achievement uh, that Kant produced, namely the critique of pure reason. I do not think that uh, Kantian rationality is supposed to be pure in any way, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Kant, in fact, is relating to uh, thinkers of the Enlightenment who took rationality to be uh, capable of producing purity, pure truth, that is, um, uh, technically speaking, basically analytic truth, right, and tries to criticize this, to say reason actually cannot have this authority. Um, mm -hmm. Thinking can only be not tyrannical. The only way to prevent reason from being tyrannical from being um, yeah, unjust uh, to falling into illusions is to criticize the alleged purity of reason. This is why he writes a book that's called mm. A Critique of Pure Reason. Now, human beings have a body, but of course, um, uh, the Kantian analysis of rationality has everything to do with uh, um, the claim that um, we cannot know truth without the senses, without reference uh, um, to space and time. That um, um, I think is an excellent um, way to at least begin to see that simply ridiculing the tendency, and it exists, and of course it's not, um, often it's a sophisticated tendency uh, done by excellent philo philosophers. Um, uh, um, this issue is not going to be resolved here, but the tendency to just mock Kant the purist mm -hmm. is uh, from the get-go, problematic. What are synthetic a priori judgments? What is the attempt to defend synthetic a priori judgments if not the insistence that rationality is not pure and cannot be pure, right? That's um, on a first pass. There is still, and that is where um, um, the debates I think are becoming more interesting. Um, there is still the Kantian insistence that we can preserve freedom, genuine freedom, freedom of spontaneity beyond or behind, so to speak, the thinking subject. So uh, the one thing which by no means will make rationality pure, but which would resist um, um, empiricism and reductionism into naturalism, right? Mm -hmm. Is the insistence that um, precisely once we understand that the structure of rationality is not pure, Precisely when we are understand that the structure of rationality has to be combined of the freedom of the subject and um, the uh, uh, sensory world, we have to preserve the freedom of the subject. We have to assume the freedom of the subject. Mm -hmm. And I take that to be a, um, a powerful way mm -hmm. to see the motivations of the Kantian philosophy. Mm -hmm. um, most often, um, in my view, even though this is by all means too sweeping now uh, a statement, when people just ridicule um, uh, Kant, the purist who pretends we don't have a body, Kant does not pretend we don't have a body. He knows fully well we have a body and he knows that rationality um, can only be successful in relation to the senses, und so weiter und so forth. Mm. But he preserves an argument that would show that without assuming the freedom of the subject behind it, um, 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 there would be uh, 
no rationality at all. Let me, in a way, uh, try to even turn the table um, uh, mm -hmm. at the opponent. Mm -hmm. Often the opponent, I think, they want purity. I don't think that I'm just now uh, uh, playing a game of words when I say that. They want the purity because they want a reductionist account. Reductionist accounts are always about purity. It's going to be all idealist or all biological, or all psychological, or all historical. Mm. The Kantian position is exactly not pure because it needs freedom, radical freedom. That's true. But this radical freedom can only have, um, can only operate in relation to the world. The attempt to um, uh, mock this as um, a philosophy of purity, um, while actually seeking purity by saying, well, this is, psychology through and through, biology through and through, history through and through, sociology through and through, is actually attempts to preserve this purity. Um, I think that when Kant writes a critique of pure reason, he actually insists on something much more complicated. Mm. Um, excuse me to, to, to maybe um, give this, this idea a more broader spin, because if you argue that the idea in Kant of a critique of reason uh, includes drawing the, the borderlines of reason and defining where reason may end. Would that, would that in, a, in a broader sense mean that the critique of enlightenment is already present in enlightenment, that the, the, the self-critique of the West is a part of the West, that maybe we should be careful not to throw away uh, Kant uh, and, and all of this, these very important universalist traditions uh, too, too fast? Or am I, I, well, I definitely believe that. Pushing, yeah. pushing you too far here? Yeah, I, no, you're not, you're not pushing me too far. I, I definitely think that the critique of pure reason mm. could have been called already a critique of enlightenment just mm. as well. Here's one way in which uh, I would be telling that story. Um, um, I, I'm interested in the comparison between Kant and Spinoza. Think of Spinoza um, 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 by some standards, again, complicated, too complicated, by some standards, the, uh, the opening shot of the radical enlightenment, right? Spinoza is a radical enlightenment secularist, um, starting the critical philosophy by subjecting the authority of the Bible, the authority of revelation to the authority of reason. And that's the assertion of the radical enlightenment. Why? Because now reason asserts its authority over religion, over prophecy, basically. Right? That becomes, becomes the judge, right? This, this is right. the metaphor. Reason, exactly. judge, and yeah. And, and Spinoza, in that sense, is the first critical philosopher because he begins in this little um, uh, field that's called biblical criticism mm. um, by subjecting the Bible to the authority of reason. Mm -hmm. um, now, um, that is an enlightenment uh, project by, par excellence and uh, a radical enlightenment project. And it, it's, um, it's not a minor thing, right? Because it's all about authority. That's the issue. It's about the authority of reason. Here is um, how I understand Kant in relation to this Spinozist maneuver. Kant is writing the critique of reason. So he's doing what Spinoza did to the Bible. He does to reason. Mm. Um, to that extent, he does um, um, already a critique of enlightenment. If enlightenment was the assertion of the authority of reason in the most robust sense against the authority of prophecy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. prophecy and religion would become tyrannical if not checked by the authority of reason, Spinoza, and he's not wrong about this, then basically what Kant is doing, if that's enlightenment, Kant is all pure enlightenment, if you'd like to call it that. When he says, Spinoza is right with his criticism of religion. However, we need to subject reason itself, enlightenment itself, the authority of reason itself to examination. Mm. Otherwise it would become tyrannical. Otherwise enlightenment would become tyrannical, indeed dialectical. And Kant has um, an important part of Kant's critique of pure reason is of course, the dialectic. Now, the interesting and maybe problematic part of this is that this criticism is itself rational, right? So um, um, we criticize reason, but we criticize reason rationally. Mm. 
On a bad day, we would say that this is again then an assertion of purity again, because reason is its own critic. Mm -hmm. On a good day, we would call this um, not purity, but autonomy. That would be an expression of reason's um, autonomy. And I, I would agree, and I, so those things are complicated. I would agree that the relation between purity, which I said Kant is a harsh critic of, and autonomy um, uh, needs to be problematized. So is autonomy, is the idea that reason is the judge also of itself when it criticizes itself? Mm -hmm. Um, is it an assertion of, autonomy, of uh, purity in the back door and which uh, causes um, um, new problems? It's absolutely fascinating for me to, to hear this perspective on Kant because, um, you know, in, a, in the German context where I was raised in, in my German high school, the cliche of the purity fixated Kant was exactly what, what I was confronted with. Um, and so it's very interesting for me to uh, to hear from you about your your um, view on 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 Kant, which which isn't uh, that fixated on purity at all. I mean, it's very interesting to to recall that in Germany there are two words for for being clean. It's it's sauber, which is the mediocre way of being clean, and then there's pure purity, which is you know has a lot of connotations. I would I would also like to hear from you. I mean, you're you're working uh, in, in Hebrew, in, in English, of course, most of the time, and then also in German. And, and one other topic, uh, which is, I think, relevant in this context of universalism is also the, the relation between thinking, reason, and language. And by language, I mean particular languages like Hebrew, German, English. Um, I mean, maybe it's just a cliche, but uh, I think many philosophers would agree that it's, it's uh, not such a, a fundamental problem to translate uh, Immanuel Kant, but that things get a, a lot more difficult when it comes to Hegel or, or others. What is your experience as a philosopher changing from one language to another? Is, is that a, a, a lived experience that, that gives you the feeling that universalism and thinking by changing the languages is, is possible? Or do you feel like different kinds of brains are switched on once you change the languages? It's a very interesting question. I'm not sure that I have uh, an easy answer to this. Um, um, initially, I mean, um, just thinking about this fast, I would say no. So I do not feel that it's difficult to switch. I can, um, I can do the switch um, and if the, there are meaningful differences for me, maybe this just means there was something subjective about my uh, mediocrity, you know, uh, uh, the fact that I'm uh, just one individual and I do not switch in different languages to uh, wear an another mask that's deep mm. or something of the sort. But um, for me, this is an interesting maybe uh, perspective on your question, Philip. Um, for me, always reading, um, philosophers in the original was not the main experience that opened me up to those philosophers. What did was following up and reading the secondary literature on them. So uh, interestingly enough, um, reading Kant in German or English, by the way, in Hebrew, it's a different experience completely because as a, the as a Kant in Hebrew that I read was uh, uh, not the new translation, but the old translation, which is uh, a walk of art uh, um, um, by its own standards, never mind that. But the differences between the English and the German were not massive. I can point to some mistakes of translation that I found, but this is always a little bit, uh, you know, um, it's, not, it's not as important, I think, as people pretend. But reading a different tradition of interpretation, mm -hmm. because, uh, the Anglophone tradition of um, interpreting Kant and the German tradition of interpreting Kant is, of course, completely different interested in different um, um, issues, um, um, has a different taste to language and so forth and so forth. I've, I can say that I've made this experience also with Descartes and French, mm -hmm. though my French is not as, as good as my German, but um, it exists to the extent that, that the, the main thing was a tradition 
rather than the language per se. And that was an interesting experience for me. Mm -hmm. um, the type of problems that people are interested in, um, um, not necessarily the, um, the philosopher uh, himself in uh, my cases, because I've been working on Kant, Spinoza, Descartes. Mm. Um, um, yeah, interesting. What is your experience? Well, uh, I, I do change a lot from German to French, of course. I mean, um, I, I really think it, it, it very much depends on, on, on the author uh, and the texts. I mean, uh, I, I, I would agree that, that maybe Kant isn't that difficult to, to translate. And I mean, there are some universities in Germany where Kant is read in, in English already, which is, in my view, a disgrace. But OK, maybe it's <laughs> there's, so, there's so much important literature on, on Kant in English, so maybe that, that isn't the main problem. But uh, Hegel, Nietzsche, uh, and all the phenomenologists, uh, Heidegger, Husserl, and so on, I mean, they, uh, things get, get, get more muddy. Um, maybe that's, that hints to a certain problem of these philosophers. That could be, that could be a problem, yeah, because maybe they are too poetic. Um, but uh, I'm, I'm, I would really love to, to learn enough Hebrew in order to see if there's a, a different grammar which um, implies a different way of looking at things. I can, I can uh, I, actually, I, I think that's, that's a good point and that I was actually thinking this while I was speaking. The, uh, um, it may have to do with the type of thinker you're dealing with, you know, uh, um, um, arguably the cogito, if successful, mm -hmm. and it's probably not successful, but to the extent that it's a successful argument, I think therefore I am, it's supposed precisely to transcend uh, uh, language in a certain way. So that's part of the, um, the problem, arguably, mm -hmm. with the argument. But um, to the extent that you're trying to follow that argument, language is supposed to play less of a role. For me personally, the place where I felt the translation mattered a lot, mm -hmm. a huge deal, in fact, um, is with my work on the Bible. I've been uh, 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 writing relatively a lot, quite a lot on the, uh, the Hebrew Bible, mm -hmm. um, um, the so-called Old Testament. And, uh, um, and I, I could not, um, I cannot switch on it. You know, if I have to write about this then in English or in German, I face real difficulties. Uh, I don't think that it translates. It's a poetic text. It's not supposed to be a universalist uh, text in the same way in which Kant or Descartes or Spinoza mm -hmm. uh, are supposed to be universalist texts. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think that's right. Mm -hmm. yeah. We only have a few minutes left and I would like to, um, to come back to hating morality. And, um, you know, uh, I'm also a political scientist and have in recent times switched quite a lot from philosophy, pure philosophy, if you like, <laughs> to um, political sciences. Um, I think we have a, some kind of a vision of this radical universalism uh, that you are working on, but I would like to hear from you about the, you know, the, co the institutional consequences, the political consequences of your attempt to defend a certain, a specific idea of universalism. I mean, I, I know it's a quite unfair question, uh, but just Give us some, some idea, some direction. You don't have it's to- It's perfectly fair it. question. It just will not get a fair answer because it will not get a full or a, or a satisfactory answer. Yeah. Um, um, but maybe um, a direction, you know. I'll give you two directions. Hmm. Um, um, first, um, I think that one um, institutional or exactly non-institutional uh, way to think about radical universalism in the sense that I'm trying to think about is to uh, um, uh, remember that Kant was in fact uh, a great friend of the revolution. People are always surprised about that. Um, people who know a little bit more, people who've read their Foucault or Arendt also remember that he did support the revolution, but that's always a question. How can Kant, who says, think for yourself, but obey, mm -hmm. famously, right? How can Kant, who says that, be um, someone who did not just personally supported the French Revolution, but believed that the revolution, um, that is uh, people taking the law into their own hands, mm -hmm. um, um, that's a sign that what he called the human, the human race is progressing. Mm -hmm. um, how can we make those two work? And I think that um, 
the understanding um, uh, that radical universalism actually opens up um, uh, a way to understand that is uh, maybe the main, uh, uh, for me, the main answer to that question. And in uh, uh, very briefly, I will say, um, since Kant is the attempt to formulate the idea of a law that is not man-made, that does not depend on consensus, that cannot be reduced to consensus. For that reason, it recognizes and can recognize an authority that's higher than the authority of um, um, government. To that extent, Kant as a radical universalist can support revolution. So I did not tell you how um, um, this can be embodied in an institution, but how this can be embodied in a, um, a political practice, mm. right? Because I take it that positions that um, uh, would, would try to take the concept of law seriously, but insist that law is always man-made, actually have how time justifying revolutions most of the time. And I think that paradoxically, perhaps, Kant, as someone who tried to formulate in modern terms the notion of a law that's not man-made, namely the categorical imperative, can insist that um, sometimes we ought to do, um, sometimes we ought to take the law into our own hands. Um, 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 of course, it's well known that for Kant, um, there is never a right of a revolution. Mm. You cannot have a right to revolt. But I think Kant would say that it's a uh, species. Yeah, it's a uh, um, um, it's a wrong um, thing to want to have a right of a revolution. Sometimes you ought to do something to which you do not have the right. Mm. And um, the realization that rights go through man-made law, but that the categorical imperative is higher than that is, I think, um, the most interesting uh, um, Kantian legacy for us, the attempt to... Um, um, so the question is, is insisting on a law that's not man-made just a religious baggage? Mm -hmm. Or is it actually one of the most interesting uh, enterprises, the most interesting uh, challenges for modernity um, uh, to see whether it can adopt it? I look at uh, uh, um, um, political people like Martin Luther King, people who um, are definitely not speaking um, in the name of identity, mm. they speak in the name of universalism. People who insist, right, in uh, uh, texts like the letter from uh, uh, Birmingham Jail, insist that an unjust law is no law at all. Mm. That's a quote. How can we think about this term, in, about this statement, not from um, um, a religious perspective, but from a modern perspective? I think Kant is the best, um, is the best we have for that. Okay. One last question, um, because we, we talked, we started with, with the situation in the United States. And are you optimistic about the, the future of, radical universalism or or do you feel your your project is, is in a defensive against a huge vague of whatever you may call it i have hope i'm uh, i think that um i think so, to be a, a little bit uh cliche haft i think the future is not determined um i i i think that there are reasons to worry i think that there are reasons to worry that uh, um the right causes are losing and not winning. However, I also see uh, uh, developments. Um, for example, for me, teaching Kant to young students, I always feel that um, they sort of get it. They sort of uh, feel the problems with the type of uh, what you uh, label uh, hate of morality, mm -hmm. um, hate of universalism. Mm -hmm. And um, I see them thinking. So it's not just about uh, whether they agree with me or not, which of course is really not what I'm trying to achieve, but rather I see people thinking, problematizing it to that extent when I see that this is happening and, and it does happen. Mm. And uh, it does give you reason for hope. 
Omri, thank you so much. I think we we enjoyed learning from you and we, we've seen that philosophy can bring people together and good luck for you. Thanks, Felix. Thank you so My much. My pleasure. Thanks. Pardon me? We're all, okay. Yeah. okay, okay, yeah. So, uh, Felix, we, we went slightly, my fault, we went sidetracked, but it um, was good. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Uh, I, 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 some of the questions just...